God's Hands by Michael Coleman. Ian's hands trembled ever so slightly. He registered his small emotional disturbance, but did not hesitate. Steady again, and without another hint of feeling, he cut. The bright edge of the blade flashed like the facet on a diamond before disappearing into the woman's flesh effortlessly. Her body was absolutely still now. A slash of red ooze, viscous, bright, with her life-giving oxygen, it trailed a string of vermilion pearls along the smiling wound of his cut. The ruddy pearls clung to the edge of her skin for a moment before their surface tension failed, and then they ran. Like scarlet ribbons, away from the slice in her body, the warm blood cooled quickly on the cold, white skin. Her pale complexion was smooth and waxy, beautiful. He thought she looked like Disney's Snow White, lying in motionless perfection in her crystal coffin. His hand had never, ever trembled before. He knew this part no longer excited him. But the first time, when he had been exalted, his mood pitched high and expectant. Even then, his hand had been steady as a rock. As his bloody hands automatically manipulated the blade, his mind sourced the cause of the uncharacteristic tremor. He had been thinking of a future. That was it. A future where a greater exaltation awaited. Fulfillment on a different plane. Ecstasy, beyond any drug, was to be his. The end of a great quest was nigh. Orgasmic-like pleasure palpitated through him at the thought. Obsession can make a beast of burden of a person. Ambition, lust, retribution, greed, evangelistic fervor, all can become yokes. Controlling direction, restricting movement to within the furrow, forever driving their beast on always becoming heavier, always restricting vision and judgment, always demanding more. More time, more effort, more often, and always, always more fulfillment. Some people resist. They begin to see the forever unchanging road ahead. They do not know where their struggle against the burden will lead. Yet they struggle and eventually manage to throw off their yoke. And many find joy in this new freedom. Others are forever unaware of another way and become victims of their own constant obsession. But not Ian. He was neither struggler nor victim. He had created and controlled this goal. Before he was an adult, he had thought of it, had planted it firmly in his brain and deep in his breast's core. From there, it pounded through him, reaching into even the narrowest capillary with every blood-pumping beat. Every second of every minute, he knew it was there. He nurtured it. He lived for it worked hard for it. No wife could have had a more attentive husband. When he was young, he was not sure it would flower, just that it would. It was part of him. While the blossoming was now close, oh, ever so close, he felt his blood-soaked hands tremble again. He erased the future for a moment and forced himself back to the present, back to the task in hand. The woman was young, and in spite of her pallor, her beauty was startling. They always seemed to be good-looking, and certainly wealthy. But soon it was over. He felt nothing. Yet it used to satisfy him so much. Well, that's that. She will be fine. Tony, you finish. Sew her up, and I'll see you tomorrow. To reassure himself, he took a last check at the 3D hologram of his patient's brain. The image was clear and precise, just like his work. Everything was perfect. He left the operating theater, another miracle completed. The whole team stared at him. This was the first time he had ever left before an operation was fully completed. Most had been with him for years, and he had never before done anything to surprise them. Ian was steady and predictable, and a genius. One of those people who shine as brilliantly as a flawless jewel. But like most mortals, Ian was just another human a pool of still water. We are all the same. The bright, argent surface only reflects light coming from the outside, constantly reacting to the environment around us, dispensing the niceties of life. A nod and a hello here, a smile and meaningless conversation there. However, all humans, bar the simple-minded, are deep, darkly shadowed pools a lurking mystery where tiny, unseen creations of the mind spring to life. Dim and bright, 
cabalistic and open, benevolent and evil. They exist in this pool of still water, some for a lifetime and some but fleetingly. We all experience these creations, thoughts and feelings which can sometimes make us uncomfortable with our own consciousness. These are things we would never dare share with anyone. They struggle for recognition, devouring each other and rebirthing in new forms. Some disappear like a popping bubble gone forever. Others settle into the sediment below, into the underworld of the mind. A different layer, deeper, harder to probe. The scraps from above are refined here by other ferocious mind beasts, to be filled somewhere in this enveloping dark trench of the being. This is the near unfathomable subconscious. And so, the struggle continues until almost everything is processed down to a smooth oneness, a manageable mess of mind and soul. And so we learn to live with ourselves. But this can be the most difficult relationship many people ever have. The surface is yang, throwing the light back inoffensively. But this, this is yin, deep, disturbing, and darkly private. Another dimension as binding and crushing as a cosmic black hole. Controlled chaos awaiting a big bang, which, thankfully, in most cases, is never triggered. With most people, occasional shafts of light play through their depths, sometimes alarming and disturbing these observers of their own souls, and in turn granting restraint a chance. These shafts of lucidness allow most of us to live as normal, non-threatening individuals, dealing with our hurts, grievances, and disappointments. Then there are others who are never aware of anything but their bright, reflective surface. Ignorant to the darkness beneath, until sometimes, suddenly and without warning, something sets off the Big Bang. It crashes from below, exploding into bedlam through the calm surface, like a giant whale launching itself into the silent sea of the starry heavens in a maelstrom of noise and movement. And in that one maniacal moment, they can destroy forever the world they have known. But not Ian. He was neither of these. He never got a quick glimpse of his darkness. Neither was he ignorant of it. Because he never forgot his darkness. His darkness comforted him. And it drove him. He kept it securely locked away under the polished surface, vacuum sealed beneath the flawless lid. But he was always in control. Observers only saw the serious yet boyishly handsome face topped with a curly rush of facial hair, now silvering around his ears, and pale skin brought to life by the flashing radiance of jade eyes. Eyes brimming with life, searching and always computing, yet able to flash warmth and charm in a blink. These eyes and face were known the world over. No other neurosurgeon in the world could do what he had just done. He was as famous as any film star, sportsman, or politician. He was constantly in the spotlight, the world's most eligible bachelor. No one knew he was already married to the threshing tribe in his own subterranean emotions. Ian was the most famous doctor since Christian Bernard, though he tried to shun the press. They pursued him. From the time of his first facial transplant, he had never been out of the headlines. They married him off, speculated on his sexuality, and tried to anticipate his research. In return, he despised their patronizing adulation, their shifting sand dune-like opinions, and most of all, their shabby, lowest common denominator morality. Ian now carried out life-changing operations routinely. The world's best surgeons joined him to learn his techniques. Like an evangelist, he was happy to teach those who would listen, and like a messiah, he had so much to teach. Full facial transplants, the first full optic nerve transplant, a surgical cure for Alzheimer's and motor neuron disease, the total reverse of trauma-induced paralysis, and now speculation was mounting that this noble laureate was about to cross a threshold, a journey beyond the flight of Icarus, a leap beyond Neil Armstrong's small lunar step. He was about to fly in the sun god's face by challenging the limits of human existence. Ian's research had convinced him the brain could live for hundreds of years. 
Unlike the heart and other organs, it did not wear out. Nothing physical to do. No endless pumping or filtering, no pollutants to choke it out. It just sat there in its own specially evolved environment, facilitating minute electrical impulses and housing that which we would never understand fully, the mind, what some call the soul. The brain really was the temple of all good and all evil. It was in here that every man's spirit dwelt. All the evil the world has ever seen had been spawned in a human brain. And all any brain needed was a new support system, every few decades, to keep supplying the proper nutrients and stimuli. It was simple, really. Keep the brain and dispose of the old, worn-out body. Use total body donors, a suitable enough solution in a totally throwaway society. A full human brain transplant. Medical sci-fi was how one journalist described it. Another had called it a medical horror story on a Frankenstein-esque scale. The social and moral debate which had surrounded Ian's full facial transplant was nothing compared to the outpouring of soul-searching perplexity this news was causing. Throughout the world, those with nothing better to do and those who thought they knew better than everyone else were marching and protesting about this monstrous travesty of God's law. Ian cared little about such things. He closed the lid firmly on such thoughts, leaving them to sink into the silt of oblivion. For him, it was just the next step, another technical challenge. Ian barely remembered his father. He too had been a genius, the man who had developed organic computers, machines built around artificial proteins. They could make new internal links, upgrade and evolve naturally, and repair when required. Ian tinkered inside skulls in the same way his father has tinkered inside servers. To Ian, it was all science. No ifs or buts. No qualms. Just science. And science was the new religion. He found it hard to believe that at one time, medical pioneers had to sneak into back alleys to secretly buy partially rotted cadavers from desperate, drink-numbed grave robbers. Ian had no doubts about where he was going. Others could worry all they want about the moral consequences of advancement. Pioneers could not afford to be watching behind. It was the way ahead which needed all their attention. He had a gift, and he had a mission. Some said his genius was God-given. Ian did not care. It was just his vehicle. God may have given him savior hands, but the devil had given him drive and a dark, consuming desire. Without these elements, none of his miraculous accomplishments would have been possible. Only he knew that. It was raining as he left the theater wing and crossed to the research labs. He looked up at the towering glass monument to wealth and power and world's first mile-high building which dominated the complex. This was the corporation's headquarters. The corporation, officially called the J.C. Company, was the richest and most powerful organization in the world and known worldwide just as the corporation. The tower was also the home of the man who owned the corporation, the same person who had made Ian's work possible. Briefly, he thought of him alone up there in his tower, and he, and he himself ran to get out of the rain. Security waved him through. Caged apes were fairly quiet. One or two seemed to grunt in his direction. If they did recognize him, it was as a torturer, and nothing else. He controlled their lives and their deaths. Some of them were now on their third brains. Earlier, there had been problems. Constant fits, no limb control, self-harm, and coma. But now, there were no problems at all. That was why he was now ready for the next step. Through more security, and he entered the lift and descended to the donor level. Here, the air is hushed and cool. The light is soft and bluish, like a summer dawn just before sunrise. It came from a battery of body capsules. The support machines hum and hiss quietly, a constant lyrical drone in the background keeping the donor bodies fresh. The corporation had provided the people here, 
They were all young and had been fit before their sudden deaths. A suicide here, a drowning there, even some murder victims. They were all perfect for his research. Ian sometimes thought they were maybe just too perfect, but he never questioned their provenance. Some people live and some people die, by fair means or foul. Like the early medical pioneers, Ian did not care. The dead were really just a resource. Without them, he could never have come this far in his accomplishments. The corporation owned the research institute. They owned the university and the hospital. In some way, they owned the people who worked and studied there. They thought they owned him, too. Ian was aware of that, but he knew different. The corporation itself was owned and controlled by Jake Cooney, the JC for whom the company was named. His wealth and power was envied in every capital in the world, even in the Washington White House. He had just been speaking to the President of the European Federation and would shortly speak to the Chairman of the Federal Republic of African States. A massive trade war was developing between the two blocs. Jake had still not decided if such an event would be good or bad for his corporation. If Jake thought it were to be disadvantageous, it would not happen. He glided quietly to the window in his wheelchair to ponder the situation. It was raining on the city which lay glimmering before him. When he looked down from here, he often thought of the devil tempting Christ in the desert with the world's shining cities of sin. The reviled one had spread the world's riches before the worshipped one and offered them to him. Well, from here, Jake could see a lot of what he either owned or could buy easily, but he was not sure if he was God or the devil. Certainly, he often believed he was nearly as powerful as either. He had enriched so many lives when it suited him. Countless others he had left destroyed, casualties of his total pursuit of wealth and power. The streaming rain washed the city lights into refracted patterns on the glass. This was how Jake always saw the world, a fractured, disordered place awaiting his version of order. The weather was one thing Jake did not control yet, but it was being worked on. High in this office in the sky, he felt cocooned. The wet night intensified his comfortable feeling. A long time ago, he had stopped experiencing any sense of loneliness. His isolation fed his feeling of power. The more alone he was, the more potent the power felt concentrated as it was solely within him. He did at times feel like the mighty Zeus controlling so much from his lofty glass and steel Olympus. Jake certainly had godlike ambitions. The difficulty between Europe and Africa required some major decisions. This could be the biggest opportunity for the corporation since Jake had allowed the Indian subcontinent to be partially destroyed by Pakistan and India in the nuclear war of 2019. That had worked out well for the corporation, giving it, and of course him, enormous political power in Asia. Power he had consolidated throughout the world in the years since. But Jake was a different man now. He was old, and his feeble body, immobile and pain-wracked, now preoccupied his brilliant mind more than any other matter. The goblin-like old man in the gliding chair resented more and more every day this base intrusion of what he considered to be the, the ills of ordinary men, into the ever-calculated consciousness he had always been. However, like the weather, this too was being worked on. He had confidence his prize-winning doctor would soon offer him radical salvation. Jake liked Ian. He liked his unsurpassed talents and skill, his single-mindedness, his drive, and desire. These were traits they shared. It was nearly 20 years now since Jake at last agreed to meet the young doctor, who had been persistently trying every avenue to speak to him. And Ian had certainly been persistent even sleeping on the street outside Jake's home for a week in his determination to see him. Yes, Jake had liked Ian straight away, and in the short interview he had been granted, Ian had sold Jake his dreams and had been granted the resources for his revolutionary research. Jake was able to write off the research costs to tax, and the corporation, spreading into other areas from its roots as an innovative IT company, received the plaudits for assisting such far-reaching medical research. Back then, 
who could have ever imagined such glorious and far-reaching success for the corporation and the young doctor? And now Jake was on the brink of humanity's dream. Another chance. Ian was going to give him a new life. Once again, Jake would be young and strong, with a body fit to house what he considered to be the surest and most able mind in the world. And he had plans. The world would never forget Jake Cooney. He was now going to have at least one more lifetime to stamp even more of his influence on the world and its affairs. When the big day arrived, Ian was uncharacteristically a little nervous. But even so, his hand was steady as a rock. The operation he had lived most of his adult life for was nearly over. The intense planning and timing for the past months had been worth it. The whole team was involved, split into three groups working in interconnecting theaters. Everyone had been surprised when Ian changed the plan slightly to include a third procedure. He had suggested it late, but was insistent about involving the ape. He said he wanted to put the donor's dead brain into the ape. It would help in further new research, he had said. They knew Ian was right about it helping the research, but the senior team members felt a triple operation was stretching the resources too far. However, Ian said he was confident he could repair the damaged brain and possibly re-facilitate its use. The donor was perfect. Jake had come down to the donor preservation unit and chosen him himself. Strong and handsome and such a clean death. A gang killing in Naples, apparently, murdered with a stiletto straight through the base of the skull and into the brain. Practically painless and bloodless. Such a lucky find, Jake had said, almost ironically. Ian did not think for a moment it had been lucky, but he cared little. He moved quickly between the three theaters, Jake in one, the ape in one, and the handsome young cadaver in the third. Ian was like a movie maker, adjusting a set here, changing the script there, constantly directing and arranging his masterpiece. He was cool and collected as usual as he pushed the brain transfer modules between the theaters. Only he handled, removed, and transplanted the precious organs. That was the protocol. The lasers fired on his command, cutting, repairing, sealing. The senior surgeons assisted with sewing and connecting the blood vessels with major nerves. But it was always Ian who made all the decisions. Always Ian who directed. Without a doubt, this was Ian's show. They respected and trusted him implicitly. Then, without warning, devastation. Ian hesitated for some reason, and then the unbelievable happened. Ian panicked. Alarms began to flash and bleep on all the systems. First the donor, now with Jake's wonderful brain in place, began to flatline. Ian seemed to go to pieces. Confusion reigned. They tried to restore order, to no avail. Ian was the only one who could possibly have retrieved the situation, but he appeared to be in shock. The new, dark, and good-looking Jake died. Jake's former body died. Only the ape survived, with the dead Italian's brain. It was a disaster. The press had a field day. It was obvious they had been waiting for this. The left-wing press said if he had succeeded, only the rich would have benefited from such a radical procedure. They were right, of course. The right-wing press said God had struck the accursed project down. They were wrong, of course. Ian went to ground on the corporation's private island in the Caribbean, well protected by his own formidable security organization. He was still there when Jake's will was made public, declaring Ian to be his sole heir. There was disquiet in many quarters under the circumstances surrounding this will, because it was made just before the operation. Little attention was paid to the fact that will-making was a normal precaution before any major operation. Jake himself had insisted upon it. 
those close to, no, not close to, because he was close to no one, those around Ian at this time noticed he had no interest in this revelation about the will, nor did he seem to be depressed or terribly unhappy about his failed project. He was just different. One month later, the failed operation and the scandalous outcome of the will were still news. Ian, however, announced he was going back to work, and he did. He knew the technicians were watching him as for the first time he returned to the labs, but he did not care. He seemed happy as he approached the only survivor of that fateful day. The chimp had been on heart and lung machines since the operation. Ian had left strict instructions that no one was to go near the dead beast until he returned. He started into his work. For hours he worked by himself. He was still there hours after everyone had left. Only when he was sure he was absolutely alone did he do what seemed impossible. He roused the seemingly dead animal. The ape began to come awake. Ian removed him from the support system and put him in a cage. It was confused. If anyone had been there, they would have wondered how he had brought this animal with his dead human brain back into a conscious state. After a few hours, as the groggy chimp began to adjust to its new situation, Ian approached the cage. He took a yellow piece of paper from his pocket. It was over 30 years old, and Ian had carried it since he was a boy. It was a note from his father. A suicide note. It explained his father's death, and it had motivated and guided Ian's life. In it, his father accused his business partner of framing him for a murder so as to get total control of their growing IT company. His father died a death of shame, alone in his cell. Despised as a cowardly killer, Ian cried as he held the note up before the monkey. The ape's eyes could see the note. It was Jake Cooney who was named there as the betrayer. And it was Jake's brain trapped inside the monkey which could understand it. The monkey screamed and shrieked. He threw himself against the bars of the cage. Blood gushed from many cuts as he hit the bars again and again. Eventually, the screaming monkey collapsed with exhaustion. It whimpered as it lay bleeding and partially conscious on the stainless steel floor of the cage. Ian sedated it again. He intended to keep doing this for a long time to come. To arouse it, and torture it with the reality of its new existence in this specially created hell. If he wanted to, Ian could keep doing this for decades.